Hi, my name is Heather Hyde and I'm the Director of Sustainability here at Western. I want to spend some time today talking to you about Western's carbon reduction targets and our plans and strategies to, to achieve them. In June of 2021, Western released a new strategic plan and in it made commitments to achieve net zero emissions from campus operations by the year 2050. Western also committed to reduce our GHG emissions by 45% compared to 2005 levels by the year 2030. I'm going to walk you through our strategy to reduce carbon on campus and talk about the many projects that have been completed or are, are underway that are moving us along our carbon reduction journey. When we talk about reducing our carbon footprint on campus, the focus of the discussion centers on our natural gas fired boiler plant that generates steam for campus. You might ask why are we focusing on the steam plant? Approximately 80% of our reported scope 1 GHG emissions come from the natural gas that we burn at our central boiler plant in order to produce steam. The steam generated by the boiler plant is supplied to campus for heating and humidification and is also used for research and process equipment for sterilization such as autoclaves and other research equipment. The university also supplies steam to University Hospital for their heating and sterilization processes. Annually about 10 to 15 percent of our reported emissions are directly related to the steam that we produce for the hospital. When we talk about our carbon reduction efforts, it's important to note that these efforts really started back in 2014 when the university first completed a utilities and infrastructure study. This utilities and infrastructure study was initiated in conjunction with the 2015 campus master plan, which laid out how campus potentially could grow over the next 30 years. The utilities and infrastructure study was initiated to assess the current state of the infrastructure on campus and identify potential constraints and pinch points in the existing system. And it also identifies um, how the infrastructure was going to need to expand and grow to support the master plan. As a bit of background, I want to take a couple of minutes to give an overview of the infrastructure that we do have on campus. It's important to do this as we are going to be talking a lot about how this infrastructure will support our transition to low carbon. As I mentioned earlier, we have a central steam plant that consists of five boilers that provide steam to campus. We also have a chilled water system that consists of two independently operated chiller plants. One of this, the plants is located in the north of campus and the other lo is located in the south part of campus. These chiller plants operate seasonally during the summer months and typically that's between the, the middle of April and the middle of October and they provide chilled water for the air conditioning on, in the buildings on campus. We also have several buildings that have what we call standalone chillers. These chillers are located in um, the specific building and provide cooling for only that building with no connection to any of the central systems. The utilities and infrastructure study identified that our heating and cooling systems would need to expand and grow fairly significantly to support the growth in the master plan. Back in 2015, it also identified what many on campus already knew, which was that our chilled water plants were already nearing capacity and that we would likely need to build a new chiller plant in the short term to support campus needs. At that time, a significant amount of money was identified and earmarked for a new chiller plant and work began on that plant. During the development of the utilities and infrastructure study, we asked the team to take a look at our infrastructure and make recommendations about how we should start to think about reducing our carbon footprint. The team at the time identified that the biggest opportunity was to transition from high temperature steam to low temperature hot water for our heating needs, which is much more efficient. They recommended that we replace all of our steam boilers with hot water boilers and install all new hot water infrastructure across campus to support this approach. Not only was this going to be extremely expensive, it was also going to be incredibly disruptive across campus. Following the original utilities and infrastructure study, we engaged another group to look specifically at reducing our carbon footprint. 
They took a very innovative approach in developing a low carbon utilities and infrastructure study for the university, which is actually based on utilizing our existing infrastructure. The low carbon utilities and infrastructure study has really formed the foundation and basis for our carbon reduction strategy moving forward. And I'm going to go through the work that we've done and what's underway to help us move along the journey. To give everyone a sense of the scale of work that has been completed so far, we estimate that since 2014, somewhere between 30 and 40 projects have been completed or are currently underway in support of this low carbon strategy. The overall concept of the strategy includes moving away from steam heating to low temperature hot water heat. But what's really innovative about the approach is that we're transforming our existing seasonal chilled water system into an energy system or an energy loop as we call it. And that energy loop is going to be used to transfer energy between the buildings on campus. At the building level, building energy use will be optimized and recovered in every possible way. That recovered energy will be used within the building and if there's additional energy available that can't be used within the building itself, it will be injected into the energy loop so that it can be shared with any buildings that need it. In order to create an energy, an efficient energy loop using our chilled water system, the first thing that we needed to do was optimize our south chiller plant so that it operated as efficiently as possible. We did two major things as part of this project. First, we made changes within the plant itself to get, it, to get as much chilled water capacity as possible from the existing chillers. We also looked at the sequencing of the chillers and changed how they operated to ensure that the most efficient chillers were operated first. This was an extremely uh, successful project that was able to get a significant amount of additional capacity from the existing equipment. The next initiative that um, involved in creating an energy loop was the installation of a flue gas heat recovery unit on the exhaust of boiler number one in our steam plant. Boiler number one is the, the boiler that's used most often and is the most efficient. And this project essentially captured the waste heat that would have otherwise been rejected out of the boiler stack and injected it into the chilled water energy loop. As I mentioned, boiler one was selected because it was the largest, most efficient and most used boiler in this, this plant. This project created the first source of energy for the loop. Around the same time as that project, we selected two buildings on the south side uh, of campus on the South Chiller Loop, the Spencer Engineering Building and the Claudette mckay Lasson Pavilion, and completed deep energy retrofit projects in both of those buildings. These projects involved optimizing the mechanical and electrical systems in the building to recover as much energy as possible, which is a key element of the work. And we integrated this we integrated a heat recovery chiller into the building. This heat recovery chiller is the main mechanism um, that is used to connect the buildings to the energy loop. Along with the mechanical system improvements, the deep energy retrofit project also included lighting upgrades and significant improvements to the piping insulation within the building itself. With the completion of these four projects, we essentially created an energy loop on the south side of campus and proved that this energy loop concept works. All of these projects were hugely successful in achieving that. The next step was really to look at how we could uh, expand and scale this concept across campus. So the next project that helped expand this concept to the north end of campus uh, involved installing a bi-directional pumping station that connects the north and south chiller plants together. This pumping station is a series of pumps and valves that allow us to move water from one end of campus to the other in either direction and we can operate both of our chiller loops as one large system. It's as exciting because what it does is it expands our ability to share energy across the entire campus. With both loops now connected, our focus turned to the North Chiller plant to ensure that this system is also operating as efficiently as possible. 
This project is very similar to the work that was done in the south and will make changes within the plant to create additional chilled water capacity from the existing uh, equipment. When we think about the controls and sequence of the plant, we actually have an additional opportunity now that both plants are connected together. We will be able to operate both plants as one large system and sequence all of the chillers based on efficiency regardless of where they are physically located on campus. If the most efficient chillers are located in the south, for example, we can operate them and then use the new bi-directional pumping station to move water where it needs to go. The next initiative in our low carbon strategy is to enable our, our system to operate year round. As I mentioned earlier, our current chilled water system only operates during the summer months. With this strategy, we will need to have a chilled water available during the winter months when the chillers don't operate. We are able to do this by winterizing one of the cooling towers at the chiller plant. Once this project is complete, we will have a year round energy loop. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about new construction and renovation projects. It's important to point out that we have been building sustainable buildings for quite a long time, since 2010 when we constructed our first LEED certified building. We have continued that work and now have 13 LEED certified buildings on campus, the most recent of which is the Amit Chakma Engineering Building. That was our first LEED Platinum building on campus and at the time it was constructed was only the third in Canada on a university campus. In 2015, Western developed sustainable de design guidelines which are loosely based on LEED. They have been used to inform our design, design decisions on all construction projects since 2015. I'm going to talk specifically about a few new construction and renovation projects that have been designed in alignment with our low carbon energy loop strategy. The first project is the renovation at Thames Hall, which is, was completed at the end of last year. This project was designed uh, with more efficient uh, mechanical and electrical systems. They, it incorporated the principles of heat recovery and included the integration of a heat recovery chiller into the, dis into the design. This building is now connected to our energy loop and we're excited that this is our first major renovation project to do so. The next new construction project is the biomedical research facility for the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, which is currently being constructed between Siebens Drake and Dental Science. This building is a research intensive building. The mechanical and electrical systems in this building were designed with a significant focus on energy efficiency. When operational, we expect this building will be between 80 and 90% more energy efficient than a typical building of that type. The design of this building has also integrated a heat recovery chiller into it and the BMR BMRF will also connect into our energy loop. Weldon Library is a unique renovation project as it is a multi-phase renovation project which is currently in construction for phase one. This project has been designed in alignment with our low carbon strategy. What's interesting about this project is that the heat recovery chiller won't actually be installed likely until phase two or phase three when a more significant portion of the building has been renovated. But the entire building has been designed so that it can switch over to low temperature hot water heating when the heat recovery chiller comes online. The next new construction uh, project that I want to talk about is the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Centre which is currently under construction. This project is really exciting because from a carbon perspective we have really stepped up our approaches. When complete, we expect that this building will be zero carbon from its energy requirements. This is being achieved through several measures. There has been a tremendous focus on the building envelope and this building will be constructed with more insulation in the walls and roof than typically is done. Triple paned windows will also be installed throughout the entire building. Another important but often overlooked aspect that is being carefully designed is the air tightness of the building. Essentially, that is how much air leaks out of the building through the walls, windows, doors, etc. 
Every building has some level of air leakage, but minimizing it can have a significant impact on the overall energy demands of a building. For this project, the design team is not only considering air leakage in the, in the design, but they have targets set and will be testing air leakage during and after construction. This will be a first for our campus. In addition to that, a solar PV array will be installed on the roof of the building, and it will also have our first geothermal plant installed. In addition to all of these other features, the mechanical and electrical systems are being designed with a focus on heat recovery and efficiency, and it includes the installation of a heat recovery chiller, chiller which will enable it to be connected to our energy loop. As we look forward to new construction projects, we need to seriously consider incorporating these types of measures into all new construction projects. We need to um, minimize the amount of additional emissions that we introduce on campus through new construction projects. Now I want to shift and talk about uh, the efforts that we're making on our existing buildings. We have nearly 100 build existing buildings on campus already. What we are implementing is a deep energy retrofit project for existing buildings. We currently have eight projects um, at various stages of, of a feasibility study, and we expect to turn several of them into projects in the near future. These deep energy retrofit projects re-engineer the mechanical and electrical systems in the building and integrate heat recovery chillers so that they can be connected to the energy loop. When we look to our 2030 carbon reduction goals, we estimate that we will need to complete four to five of these deep energy, retro, deep energy retrofit projects a year to meet our goals. Next, I want to talk about um, the buildings I mentioned earlier that have standalone chillers. Part of our strategies includes connecting these standalone chillers into the energy loop. And this is being done for two reasons. First of all, by connecting into the system, we are further expanding our ability to recover and share energy with even more buildings on campus. The second relates to the overall chilled water capacity. For these buildings with standalone chillers, we know that all of those chillers have additional capacity than the building actually needs, and they were des designed this way. But this extra capacity isn't currently being utilized. By connecting these chillers into the larger system, we're actually able to take advantage of this unused capacity. And by doing that, we can actually look at how we need to make investments in these standalone chillers and really make uh, smart decisions and, and only invest where we need to. As we move across campus, we are looking at every opportunity to better utilize existing infrastructure to avoid making unnecessary investments. Now I want to talk about two other exciting initiatives that we have underway. The first is a geothermal feasibility study, and this study will be completed to look at the potential for a larger scale ge geothermal plant on campus. This study is going to look at the entire campus and identify the areas that will be most suitable for a larger scale geothermal plant, and it will also look at the potential capacity of each site. This is going to give us a, a really good understanding of the overall potential for geothermal on campus. This project is underway and we hope to have a, a study complete um, early this year. The second initiative is we're looking at the opportunity to install an electric boiler in our power plant, which would replace a natural gas fired boiler. Essentially, you can consider this as a fuel switching opportunity from natural gas to electricity, but will have a, potent, uh, a significant impact on our carbon emissions, as the electrical grid in Ontario is relatively clean. For this project, there are major implications to our electrical infrastructure that will have to be carefully considered as part of that study. Again, that study is underway and we hope to have that finalized uh, later this year. As you can see, there's a lot of exciting uh, carbon initiatives underway, and I hope this presentation's given you a really good overview of what Western is doing to reduce our carbon emissions. Thank you.